my friends. Thank you for joining us for the PebCAC Podcast, a weekly information security show featuring some all-around good people. It is week 46 of 2021, and we are adjusting back from our trip to Costa Rica. Thankfully, I used enough sunblock and did not turn into a lobster. I'm Chris Lee, and with me, I have my co-host Brian Deach, who absolutely destroyed the Midnight Buffet every night. Very funny, you son of a gun. Uh, Actually, I'm back. I'm golden brown and pleasantly plump. I think Chris might have been the only person checking his Apple Watch for the UV levels uh, over there in Costa Rica. But jokes aside, I got to tell you, the uh, the people over there in Costa Rica are truly amazing, kind, and sweet. And oh yeah, uh, it it was kind of nice to see my coworkers in person for once uh, instead of over Zoom. I think the ratio was like, I think I knew like 10 people and the rest were all that I had met before to the, you know, the other two or 300 people that were there were all kind of only via Zoom. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely good to see everybody. Good to see you, Brian. First time in probably two years. And the first time I think all of us on the PebCat got together, but we were just having so much fun out there. We didn't have time to record an, an episode out there. So we're, we're back now and, and recording. Glenn is out this week and our thoughts are with him and his family. No guests this week, just Brian and I. We hope to get a guest on once our schedule settled down. Combined, we have decades of information security experience and are here not just to educate, but to entertain. We've got four awesome stories for you this week, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I want to start with a rant. If you guys will give me the floor for a minute, I want to talk about something that happened to me recently and, and how angry it makes me. Way back on episode 5, seems like a lifetime ago by now, but we discussed how to securely send a large amount of money without getting hacked or compromised. Well, it finally happened, and I made an investment which required transferring that money. As part of the process to make this investment, the company I'm working with me to help finance this investment, they had to pull my credit, and that's that's not really a problem for me, because one hard pull in the last five years, that's not really going to damage my credit. So the problem came when my credit got pulled and then my phone literally started blowing up. I probably got like eight or 10 calls a day of other companies, other competing companies that were offering me uh, to, to help sell me some, you know, investment services. And, you know, at at first I thought it was kind of weird. I said, you know, I usually get like the extended car warranty calls. I get other spam calls. I even have spam blocker on my, my line. So these guys still got through somehow, but I thought it was kind of unusual. And then when one of the spam callers left a voicemail, they they tipped me off to exactly what was happening. And the voicemail said something like this that said, we we work with Experian, TransUnion, Equifax. We work with them and they let us know when people are looking for credit or when their credit's pulled or when they're looking for help with investments. And we just want to call you and we can give you this awesome rate. And that triggered it in my mind. I said, okay, so they pulled my credit, they talked to the three major credit bureaus, and those three major credit bureaus sold my information to these people to say, here's a hot lead. Someone just ran their credit for this type of financing. Please go spam them. And you know these, these companies will probably pay the credit bureaus a fee. In exchange, my phone gets totally blown up and they totally sold my information, which which really, really upsets me. And uh, I talked to some some people in the industry and they said yeah that, that's actually happening a lot more now that these credit bureaus are selling your info and that's just another way to make money but unfortunately that's that's really the only way to get credit is they have to check with these credit bureaus to see if you're you're credit worthy and i uh, just want to throw it out there there is a fourth credit bureau called innovis and when you want to do like a a, a freeze or a lock in your credit uh, that's the fourth one so you have to do the three major ones and innovis is is the fourth one and I, I think credit bureaus, they need competition. And really, I, I feel that's a huge scumbag move to take your data and, and sell it like that. Dude, I, I feel your pain on that. I, I went to go buy a, a vehicle for one of my kids that had you know saved up some money and we we're matching it. And so we're going in there to pay cash for a car. But to them, the red flag is, you know, I want to you know write a check. Uh, for the vehicle, I don't want to finance. And they're like, hey, you know, we can do this, but we need to make sure that we run your credit so you, you know, you are as advertised. I'm like, whatever, right? I'm, like, How often do I actually buy a car? I don't care. Um, go through the thing that, you know, they run the credit. They're like, no problem. Uh, you know, we'll take your check, blah, blah, blah. And then a couple of weeks later, I, I had, uh, I, I think it was like a notice to let me know um, that my credit had been run 
from this uh, this uh, car dealership, and I had eight inquiries. It's like they sent it through every one of their financial institutions. I was <laughs> oh wow, and like yeah. it's all. I'm just like okay, you know this sucks, but like what am I gonna do about it? You know what I mean? Like it's it's too late now. Maybe I can call and argue and have the hits taken off, but I have no idea. I, I think the rule is if the the checks are done within there's a, is a period. I think it's within a thirty or sixty day period. It only counts as one because that was, that used to be a scumbag move that the banks or the the car dealerships they'd run your credit, it ding your score, then they run it again, it ding your score, and they keep running it until they dinged it enough that we're like, oh yeah, you you qualify for twenty four percent APR based on your credit because we drove it into the ground. So. Yeah, Actually, I remember what happened. It was uh, when I went to get the solar panels that it had come up. They're like, can you please explain why you have these eight inquiries on your credit? I'm like, oh, I bought a car, but like, I don't understand what's going on here. I had to write, <laughs> write a letter to explain, you know, my existence to them. So, uh, you know what? You might be on a rant in a soapbox, but I'm right there with you, man. Yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, until we find out some other way to determine your credit worthiness than your nine digit social security number here in the US. I think we're we're stuck with the credit bureaus. I, I'm glad there's a fourth. They definitely need competition, but you know, nobody's ever heard of it, so no one's gonna use it. It's it's sort of that catch twenty two. Yours is nine, mine's only eight. Just kidding. <laughs> All right, on to our first topic. Uh, a company called Zeronium, they're, they're in the business of selling software vulnerabilities. They've, they've been around since uh, 2015. They're headquartered out in Washington, D.C., which should give you some hints as to what their motives are. But they're, they, they bill themselves as a broker for zero-day exploits. And how that works is typically when there's a, a bug bounty program, like with through Apple or Tesla or Microsoft, they say, if you can come up with a... For example, Apple, like if you have a no click remote code execution vulnerability, Apple will pay you a million dollars for that, that particular exploit. And then you submit it to Apple, they verify it, and then they pay you the million dollars and they fix it quietly behind the scenes. What Zerodium does is they say, okay, well, we recognize your yeah, Apple will pay you a million dollars. We're going to give you $3 million for that remote, no click remote code execution bug for iPhone or, or iPad. Now they claim they only sell it to governments and law enforcement agencies, but you know, we know what that means, hint, hint, NSO group. And they will turn around and sell it to a foreign government for say $8 million and say, you have exclusive use of this exploit, or they'll sell it to that government for a million dollars and say, we're going to sell it to anybody who will pay a million dollars. And the more this exploit is out there, the more likely it'll get, it'll get patched. So Zerodium sits really in that gray area. My, my personal opinion of them is that I think their existence is not good for the security community. I think the bug should be sent to the manufacturers for patching. They should be responsibly disclosed and they should be patched. They should not be resold to other uh, governments and law enforcement agencies. But that's another argument for another day. Well, it turns out Zerodium right now is paying top dollar for zero day exploits for Windows uh, VPN clients. So clients like ExpressVPN, that's a very popular one. You hear them advertise a lot on podcasts and YouTube channels and they sponsor a lot of people. But really the purpose of a VPN is to hide a user's identity. If I am at home, I VPN into a server in say Sweden and then I visit a website, that website thinks I'm actually coming from Sweden. Now Zerodium is paying top dollar for exploits for either uh, like public IP disclosure, um, IP address leakage, or even rem remote code execution in these Windows VPN clients. And you got to wonder, what are they going to do with that once they have it? Because a VPN, really by nature, it's a security product, it's a privacy product, and they're looking to circumvent that. that. So that should be an early warning to people that use these, these pieces of software that somebody somewhere is coming after them. So there's a ton to unpack here because you just kind of went over a, a bunch of stuff. So part of me agrees with you on the, the, on the concept that, you know, we should just do responsibility disclosure and blah, blah, blah. But the other part of me is like, I'm a capitalist, right? I want to sell this and, and make some money off of it. And I can't remember who it is, but there is one company publicly traded, I believe that if you Find a vulnerability and it's emitted. They just give you a T-shirt. Like, congratulations, you hacked the site. That's the, that is it. There is zero cash involved. Do you know which one I'm talking about, Chris? 
Um, that one doesn't come to mind. I know that there there are some that say we'll give you gratitude, but not cash. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not insane. familiar with that one. It's kind of a jerk yeah. move. Yeah. And so the other it part varies. Is, yeah. So when you say NSO, are you talking about the 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 text message one? That if um, on iOS 14, that would just give the rem- uh, all they had to do is to send a text message to the phone, and they have full carte blanche access to the device remotely. Yeah, yeah. They had a server group. They didn't develop that exploit. That what uh, they may have. It's more likely they bought the exploit and then they use that exploit to deploy their Pegasus spyware software. Well, you know, on that note, I just got a call from uh, from Germany, right? And it came in at like two fifty in the morning. And my head yeah. immediately went to that. I'm like, what if they just figured out how to do it from a phone number now, right? Like, you don't have to answer it. And, and yeah. boom, maybe someone's in there. I have no idea. Um, got to wipe your phone now. Sorry. Yeah, right. Start over from scratch. <laughs> uh, and yeah, the last part was the whole VPN and getting an IP. Like, that's like almost straight up just baiting whoever is running the service, right? Looking for an insider that's like, man, I make $7 an hour. I can I can get this information out and make a little bit of bank on the side. So you never know, right? People's greed will always uh, chase that dollar for sure. Yeah, and, and that's the trouble. Uh, there, there's definitely a balance there that says, if, if I make this bug bounty program too lucrative, my insiders, my red teamers, my internal security team, th- they're going to make more money on the outside in reporting the bugs to me than, than their day job. So they have to balance that out. And then the other side of that is if I pay, you know, a reasonable bug bounty, you can make 10 times more selling this on the black market or just selling them to one of these, these shady uh, middle people like, like Zerodium. Uh, I remember there was a, there was a pwn to own competition maybe two years ago. And someone came up with like a, a, a hypervisor escape for VMware. And they reported to VMware they made 50000 off it, but Zerodium was paying like a quarter million dollars for that same exploit. So these researchers, they had to look within themselves. Are they a capitalist? Do they want to do the right thing? Should we responsibly disclose it? Is the world a better place selling it to VMware or to Zerodium? And, and they made the call and they, they reported to VMware, got less cash, but at least it's like you can't put a price on being able to sleep with yourself at night. But again, this kind of boils all the way all the way back down to this is what we know. Like what's out there that we don't. Like I guarantee you, there's some some terrifying things that are out there. Probably. I mean, you look at Shell Shock was around for 20 years. You know what else is going on? Yeah, yeah. And who knew about it? Who knows about it? When? How is it exploited? It's yeah. It's it's. Can it's, someone just put me in the know, please? I I would love to know about something like just crazy. That way, I can just feel like I'm a part of something for once. <laughs> I won't you tell you like you're on the inside. <laughs> this when it comes out, I'm like, guys, I knew about this. How cool is that? So I think you just open yourself up to a good fishing lure that people are <laughs> going to start sending you. I can't believe I found out about this. Click here to learn more. Go for it. You know, and the fishing thing, real quick. Uh, while we were out and about, my my daughter's like, Dad, she's like, I did something stupid. Um, I clicked on a fishing link or not a phishing link, something that came in through through Instagram and turned out to be a phishing link that had come from her uncle. And, you know, I totally put my password in there. I need to reset it. And I was like, oh, that's kind of weird uh, that, uh, you know, the security didn't capture it. So then I immediately went to my phone and sure enough, I had the same Instagram message. And I was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, gonna to click on the link and I'm going to report it as being malicious. And then I clicked it and it was blocked. Like, and like, this is like a, a five minute window of when she told me versus when I had done it. I was like, what the heck is going on? Uh, it turned out uh, while we were gone, her uh, her new phone came in the mail. So uh, every two years, if you have straight A's at the house, you're eligible for a new phone. So she, uh, she had just upgraded to iOS 13. And uh, during the migration efforts, the uh, the security I have in place didn't pick it up when she was off network. Bada boom, bada bing. That's what she, how she ended up getting uh, uh, fish. But guess what? There was nothing in her account anyways, right? Just dumb memes and, and conversations about what they're going to wear tomorrow. So that's about it. Yeah, well, I'm glad it wasn't too bad. I've heard of people's Instagrams account getting hacked and having a much worse outcome. Not just spam posts. I've heard of uh, extortion attempts too. That says, hey, if if you want your account back, you're going to make this video promoting this shady crypto deal I have. And if you don't, then I'm gonna, I'm never going to let you have your account back or I'm going to do some bad stuff to your account. So that glad it turned out. Maybe she had like okay. 100,000 followers, right? I think she yeah. had uh, like like a thousand or something like that. So it's all good. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to, to specifically call it the three VPN vendors that Zerodium is looking for is ExpressVPN, NordVPN, and Surfshark. And they're looking to unmask the actu- the true identities of the users of these services. So if you use these services, you gotta got to be careful. People ask me all the time, like, should I do this? I've never heard of the Express or the last one. I've heard of Nord. I'm like, I mean, yeah, like it will help obfuscate like your IP, but then at some point in time, someone, you know, somewhere between A and Z, there's somebody at some company that can see exactly what the hell is going on. You have to be, have some peace of mind. So whatever, like, don't do it is my, my advice on that. Why waste the money? Can't trust it. Do you, or do you run a full-time VPN there, Mr. Louie? Well, I have the world's best security proxy that hides my IP address, so I technically don't need to worry about that. But what I do recommend, so that people that that don't have the world's best proxy in the world, is find a service that has been third-party audited. Uh, I know that, uh, I want to say TunnelBear, I might have gotten the name wrong, but I think TunnelBear, they had a full third-party audit, open source code and everything, full open kimono, and they got passing grades by by everybody that's, that's reviewed it. So I think if they've if they've gone through that audit, uh, you can feel pretty comfortable that, you know, when they say there's no logs, there's no logs because there have been cases where these VPNs, uh, people say, yep, no logs, we don't track you. And turns out they keep logs and they track you. So you have to really make sure with those third party audits. All right. On to our next topic. It's been a good minute since we talked about DDoS attacks. And the topic has come up here and, and the other hosts have had good questions of saying, well, who, who benefits from this? How do I make money off this? Why would anybody want to DDoS something nowadays? So there's there's two stories here. The first one is Microsoft said it mitigated a 2.4 terabits per second DDoS attack, which is the largest ever on record. And if I remember the article correctly, it, it said that nobody even noticed. Like Microsoft was able to immediately identify it, mitigate it, and stop anything bad from happening. And They believe that there is a particular company that Microsoft host was the target. And in the meantime, the attacker just tried to take Microsoft Azure like totally offline. But thankfully, Microsoft was able to identify it, mitigate it, and nothing nothing really bad happened there. The internet didn't uh, melt down. And the other one, which is not so fortunate, is the other story for, for about DDoS are these DDoS people are now pointing their their DDoS cannons at voice over IP providers. So there are some companies like uh, VoIP Phone, VoIP Unlimited, VoIP.ms. They've all publicly disclosed that they've had DDoS extortion attempts against them, that they just blast them with so much UDP traffic that their servers get knocked offline. And when the servers are offline, well, people really rely on these VoIP services. The, it's, it's teleconferencing in the cloud. It's You can't make phone calls. You can't even dial 911 if these, these services are offline. There's just they're just offline and, and unavailable. So these companies were not so fortunate. They did get knocked offline. Some companies said they've suffered you know, millions, tens of millions of dollars in damages. And the hard part is DDoS for websites has been around for a long time. So Krebs on security gets DDoSed all the time. We figured out a good way to keep websites online. The problem is for VoIP providers, they use UDP based traffic, so not your typical web traffic, it's really hard to determine junk UDP traffic from like legitimate VoIP voice traffic over UDP. So we don't really have like a, a Cloudflare or an Akamai, somebody that has a really mature solution for DDoS mitigation on the VoIP side. So unfortunately, these, these companies are just getting taken offline and they're just at the mercy of these people trying to extort money out of them. Yeah, going back to your Azure comment and, and the, the traffic that came in, like that's incredible, 2.4 terabits per second. And they're just like, no big deal, right? We just absorbed it and call it a day. I actually had uh, a friend reach out to me the other day on LinkedIn when we were in Costa Rica. And he was asking, he's like, do you know of anybody that has multiple cloud-based DDoS protection? Like, so traffic goes through, you know, I have no idea, Akamai? Kona first, and the next stop is Cloudflare, and then on-prem uh, towards the applications where they might even have uh, some type of you know DDoS mitigation platform uh, on-prem as well. So to the listeners out there, I don't know of anybody um, that does that. So I'm curious, if you have done that, let us know one way or the other. Um, 
I'd be fascinated to to see your reasoning on it. They were looking at his resiliency, but I'm thinking, I guess your your biggest problem here is the if you can absorb it, you're okay. But if you can't, then that's really your problem. But uh, I would love to know why you guys have multiple cloud based uh, DDoS solutions. And then to follow up on the VoIP thing, something that I did really really cool in a previous life was uh there was this dude uh, he was like he's infatuated with this chick as an enrollment counselor at some college and like he just kept calling and calling and calling so eventually they're just like hey she's just like you can't keep calling me weirdo like <laughs> this isn't good i can't talk to you <laughs> so he got pissed because i think they ended up blacklisting his number or something like that from calling the the toll-free line so he yeah, that being, makes sense yeah he got pissed and he started doing uh, a telephone ddos a tdos of some nature and they, at the time, you know, the customer was like, hey, is there anything you can do to help this? And I thought, well, you know, what's actually going on? And he says, well, basically, he floods the call center with phone calls. And when they pick up the phone, it's this dead air, right? And then they have to hang up. And so it's just thousands upon thousands of calls. And like, we have like 50 people, right? And I said, well, <clears throat> maybe we could, right? And so the idea there is we ended up writing, uh, this is like a, a, something called an eye roll. Uh, F5 does it. And so we, we were collecting the UDP packets and we we're saying normal VoIP traffic or this UDP frag, uh, uh, traffic will vary in size, will look like this, but a ring no answer, an RNA will always look like this, like this, the dead air. And so we we're able to drop it. So it would still come in, still have thousands of calls, but as soon as it hit the, the low balance, we would execute that and start just dropping the calls and allow real life callers to come in. So I thought that was kind of pretty cool. Uh, use of technology. I don't know if they still do it or not, or maybe somebody else has capitalized on it. But that was a that was a fun one to prove out. Yeah, it's it's like the cat and mouse game that first this guy calls and you block his number. Then he has all these calls from. He's probably like spoofing his his number, his DID, so that he gets around the block and then just does you know no no, no answer and just floods the server. So then you come up with some type of solution. So I think the next evolution of that would be more calls but like generate a script that says play a random song from youtube and then it'd be even harder to detect but yeah it's it's always that fun that that cat and mouse game to see you know who can who can build a better mouse trap for real you know one of the coolest things i had seen back on the screensavers right kevin mitnick came out and he's like hey i'm gonna have the white house call you right now and so he picks up his phone blah 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 and all of a sudden the, the white house's number calls through to the guy's phone and that's when he started learning about the the caller id spoofing right and I remember digging into this, and uh, at the time I was working at a, a place that you know had like 50 employees or something, but we had a, a PBX, and I was talking to, to the guy that uh, would come in and service the thing, and uh, <clears throat> asked him you know a little bit about that. He's like, oh, you probably could, but you know I don't like I gotta go, like leave me alone. I, I'm adding a line here, whatever. And so I just remember just watching him like literally just tell that in there, and then I just saw how easy it was to just be like, hey, this phone line, right? Just it's it's phone number i'm going to broadcast out to the world is different like it wasn't wasn't difficult right it's like it was like editing like a freaking text uh text file so i thought that was kind of cool stuff uh, i don't know if it's still that simple or if they've improved the security around it but uh one time there i know there's one in the apple app store or at least there was where it allowed you to spoof your phone through the app and <laughs> we would call uh my friend's random friend and be like, hey, uh, like you'd be the victim, Chris. Like, hey, hey, Chris, this is Chris from the future. Like, don't apply for the job. Like, you don't want this. Like, <laughs> like all the stuff that he shouldn't know, like I shouldn't know about. And he's like, hey, what do you mean this is future Chris? This is future Chris, right? Your wife, she's sitting in the room and like just messing with him for hours. But whatever, you know. Buy I, Bitcoin at $3. Yeah. <laughs> what year is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, spoiler alert. Uh, it has not. Security for that type of PBX spoofing has not changed. And that's why we get so many spam calls on our phones now is because there's just no authentication. There's no integrity. There is a protocol being, pa I think it was passed, not implemented, but it was passed by the US FTC, the Federal Trade Commission here, that it's called shaken and stirred. It's, it's some stupid acronym that they shoehorn to make a cool sounding name but it's called shaken slash stir and it's basically adding uh, public key cryptography to the uh, phone number process that makes it basically impossible to spoof so so today there are these emails that have digital signatures that says yeah this was sent by chris louis been verified by digicert 
and there's just no way to spoof it. You can't change the contents. You can't change the sender. Nothing's spoofable. They want to do something similar with phone calls that says this is this person is who they say they are. This is the phone number. This has been digitally signed. There's no way to spoof it. That's what we want to get to, to just eliminate the spam problem. Uh, like everything in government and regulations, this will take years, if not decades, to implement. I mean, it's a, it's a, it would literally be like a worldwide change, right? It would have to be, yeah. Yeah, wow. because I mean, you, can, you could use Skype out of India or something if they don't if they don't support it. And but I mean, there's there's probably also a filter that says don't take calls that are not digitally signed. But like there, there could be that. Can you imagine? Yeah, our Zoom is digitally signed right now. That's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, we have end to end encryption, so we know that if you say something, you actually said it, and you can't say that somebody <laughs> deep faked your your yeah. voice. All right. On the topic of, of deep fakes, our, our next story is is about uh, B- business email compromise or BEC, but BEC on steroids. When we talked about episode on episode five about large money transfers, BEC was a huge problem. So BEC happens when attackers target someone who is about to make a large financial transaction, such as like wiring money to an escrow for someone buying a house. Then the attackers email or phone the victim and say. No, sorry, there's a last minute change to account number, send it to this account number instead. And then the person sends the money to the wrong account, the money's gone, and uh, there are a lot of sad people because of that. So BEC is the act of using social engineering to convince someone to send money to an account controlled by the attackers instead of the legitimate account. Well, it turns out the attackers are stepping up their game and using AI and deep fakes to mimic the voice of someone to convince them to transfer the money. So mimicking the voice of a CEO or a CFO or a, a controller of a, of a company. And it, it turns out attackers last year successfully stole about $35 million by using a deep fake voice to convince a company to wire money for what they believed was an acquisition. So this, the, the attackers, they got the voice of somebody pretty high up in the company, created a convincing phone call that said something to the effect of, we're about to acquire this company, please wire $35 million to you know, account X, Y, Z, uh, this is all good. It's highly confidential. So don't tell anyone about it. Don't ask questions, just do it and you won't lose your job. And unfortunately the, the voice was so convincing that the employee actually wired the money. And this is not new about two years ago, a company lost about a quarter million dollars through a similar scam, but now they've just taken it to the next level and have gotten tens of millions of dollars as a result of this. As a result, it's just no longer enough to get verbal confirmation for approvals for financial transactions. And that that was one of the strongest defenses that says, you know, when in doubt, pick up the phone, call the person, see if it's really what they want. And now that's not even good enough. So we're going to have to come up with something even better than just verbal confirmation now. No, for real. Like, I bet you this happens all the time, but I think some people are just kind of like alarmed, right? Like, hey, I don't know about this. I'm just going to hang up and maybe call you back or something like that. That's my my instinct. But there's just people out there that they couldn't just not be happy with their job. And they're just trying to get through the day or get to the, the their, you know, their next break so they can eat a, a, some some Cheetos or something. I have no idea. Uh, the good news is right now we are we are literally training uh, the deep fake AI to impersonate us. So. I mean, there's a bright side to everything, right, Chris? Yeah, well, we'll be able to fully automate this podcast at some point. And then uh, the the other part now, like when I say this, like I don't want to think, I don't want anyone to think that I'm like uh, like anti anything that's not American, right? But the reality is, when you are uh, in software sales, right, one of the questions people have is like, "Hey, where is your support team based?" Right, and it has nothing to do with people that are like in India, right? It's more about like, what was their first language, right? They, they want to combat the, the language barriers and whatnot. But when I think about this, I'm like, man, how, how, you know, it's only a matter of time before you just have a call center and like on the fly, right? It, it's spoofing, you know, weird, uh, you know, like obviously your, you know, English is your second language and putting it in a perfect grammar that you can't tell the difference whatsoever. Yeah. I think language, uh, Language, I forgot, it was language interpretation, natural language processing, something like that. That That's a very strong use case for AI and machine learning right now is is something like that. Perfecting someone's grammar on the fly uh, or even determining somebody's um, intent. So there's a lot of like anti-bullying software right now that, that schools use. And they, they take things into account that um, a single message alone 
is not threatening, but a series of messages uh, conveying some type of intent, well, that, that could potentially be, be threatening. And I think that's that's a perfect application of, of things like AI right now. Now, it, it's not perfect. There's going to be no system that's perfect, but it's better than any system we have now. And if we can identify this, this type of bullying or even something like self-harm uh, at, the, at the same time, I think that's probably a, a real good and practical use of these uh, technologies. So there's there's always two sides of the coin. You know, this is AI and ML. It's, it's a dual use technology. There's going to be some people that use it for good. And inevitably, there's got to be some people that use it for, for evil purposes. On, on the note of like text messages and stuff like that or intent, right? One of the things I learned, shoot, maybe right at the beginning of COVID. No, even longer, about four years ago was I wrote an email to somebody with like just the best intent, right? I was trying to be sweet and nice, but it's all about people's perception, right? And it was looked at like I was threatening and mean and hostile and stuff. So I, I learned my lesson, right? Like number one, if I have to convey like some sort of like a no or a negative thought, I'm picking up the phone and letting him know like, hey man, I love you, uh, <laughs> but I can't do X, Y, and Z for you. You know, I hope that we can still, you know, be on good terms. Like the last thing I want to do is upset people. So yeah, the the whole uh, looking at intent, I, th I think that could be a double-edged sword. I think that it might raise some false positives, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's, yeah, that that's, and I think, you know, over time, things things will get better, computers will get better. And, and I think that's just the nature of AI and machine learning. The more data you put through it, the better, theoretically, the, the better the algorithm gets. And, and hopefully, yeah, at some point, we're going to perfect it or nearly perfect it. And it's going to be able to pick up on on things and, you know, potentially stop something, something bad from happening. That's, that's the hope, at least. Dude, like, look at that. Did you hear what happened at that Travis Scott concert? Yeah, that was yeah, that was definitely tragic. What what happened? Um, yeah, not not just what happened, but I think the the response too. I heard that some people were yelling to the audio and video guys like, "Hey, you got to stop the performance. Some bad stuff is happening," and they just like refused to do it. And uh, th there's gonna be some investigations coming out of this. I hope that the people, the responsible, are gonna be held responsible. But yeah, very very tragic. Yeah, and if you don't know who Travis Scott is, right, he's a very popular hip-hop rap artist. And uh, during one of his concerts, like, people were being trampled, apparently, and, like, eight people died. Like, it's terrible. And, you know, people are trying to put, you know, responsibility in the venue on Travis Scott himself. Uh, I don't, you know, fall in line with his music at all, so I have no idea. Uh, good, bad, or different. I don't think anybody on stage was like, yeah, tonight eight people are going to die. I'm, I'm going to keep doing the robot. Like, I don't think that's anyone's intent, to be honest with you. But what what's kind of interesting is uh, the the question is like what should he have done differently, right? And you're like, ah, oh, you know, whatever. Like, should you stop the show? Like, how do you do that? Like, you know, whatever. And uh, what was interesting is someone showed a video, maybe when Lincoln Park was probably still relevant during a concert, in mid concert, as they're going into a song, like this, it stops, right? And the the lead singer's like, hey, listen, like if someone falls down, we pick them up. Like there's somebody fell down here. They, they are telling us someone is injured. We need to stop right now. And like everybody responded, like, like he like just took control over the situation. And, uh, you know, hindsight's 2020 for Travis. And, you know, I'm sure that whatever happens probably weighing hard, you know, on his conscience a lot, unless he's some sort of monster, which I doubt. But yeah, that the, the Lincoln, Lincoln park thing was incredible to see. Cause like just to bring the, the concert to an absolute stop and you have, you know, I don't know, 20, 30,000 people just like responding and making sure people are okay was, was, you know, that's the type of humanity I want to see. Yeah. And, and to bring it back to what we're talking about AI and ML, I, I know that there are companies out there right now that, that will take video feeds and run it through AI, run it through ML, and they hope to identify things like this, that they sit, they, they can see is the crowd you know, pushing too hard against the banister and is the banister about to collapse? Like that's happened in, in soccer stadiums before. And those have been tragic. They can take those things and say, you know, well, there were a you know, hundred people standing here. Now, now I only see about 95. What happened to those other five people? Did they fall? What happened there? So I hope the technology gets to that point where we'll be able to do use it to our benefit, prevent things like this from happening. This is when we should probably, yeah, we should probably have a conversation maybe next week on, on our thoughts about the metaverse and things like that. <laughs> yep, yep, good old Zuck. <laughs> yeah, look, spoiler, oh, I don't like one. it at all, and I, I am very opinionated <laughs> on it, so. 
Now I just sound like the old guy, like, get the hell off my grass. But yeah, hopefully I can get get that around it. Yeah, or get off my lawn. Yep. All right. And for our last topic, and this will be a rotating topic every week, I thought, at least for for us, we can talk about our our time in Costa Rica. We all just came back. We'll be sure to post a couple pictures on our Instagram account. So check us out at PevCAC Podcast. I thought it would just be nice to have a roundtable discussion of our time there. Uh, for me, it was extremely beautiful country, but as we talked about in, in previous episodes, once you're you're out of the airport, once you're out of the resort areas, uh, it, it does look like a country with uh, substandard living. Uh, one cool thing that I found out, or we found out while we were there, uh, but our tour guide said that they were really, really hit hard by, by COVID and the loss of, of tourism because they are just so dependent on, on tourists coming in, into their country. And for you know over 18 months, they just didn't have anyone visiting there. They actually said we were the first large corporate event to come back since the pandemic hit last, last March. And as a result, they were able to employ lots of people. They were able to bring it lots of money into the country. You know, there's there's airport, there's infrastructure, there's there's van drivers, there's hotel staff, there's cooks, there's people that have the capability of, of making a living once again. And our, our tour guide actually said when she became unemployed because she's in the in the tourism industry, um, she actually became a channel account manager for Lenovo. So the laptop maker where she actually went on to be one of the top sellers at Lenovo in, in Costa Rica. So definitely applaud her um, efforts there in, in starting a new career and, and being really good at it. But she actually told us that while we were there during our time there, she took PTO from her job at Lenovo. She actually still works there. And she drove four hours to come to where we were just so she can come back and be our tour guide that she loves it so much. The people there are just really passionate about what they do. Very, they take their jobs very seriously and they really pride themselves on being very professional and making sure that that you know us as their our their guests were were really happy there. Overall, the best experience I've ever had uh, in state or you know out of the out of country in my entire life. Like legit, like this the the, the nicest people ever there you know to be had. I was uh, observing one morning. Um, the you know the resort itself is immaculate like i just can't believe like i mean it is this dialed in and there was some dude out there uh he was like sweeping up some leaves and my wife's like we should tell him to get a leaf blower and I, in my head i was like i bet you they don't want to disturb the guests so just have him out this poor dude out there sweeping up uh leaves but oh my goodness it was it was great and the the last night i don't know if you caught this but um <clears throat> the last night at the kind of the going away party, I think the resort manager came up to, to thank us. And he says, you know, you know, having you guys come back, you know, it brings in enough, uh, you know, uh, income that he was able to either hire 100 people for the rest of the year or for a year. I, I couldn't really hear uh, what was going on. And I thought, holy crap, like that is amazing to be able to have that kind of impact on anyone's lives like that. And it also explained like why people were just like, uh, if you if you got to a chance to engage with them, uh, whether it was just trying to get to know them a little bit or, you know, get, you know, handing them a couple bucks for, you know, a little bit of help here or there, they'd always kind of pop back up and, and remember your name. I thought it was great. But on the flip side, when he talked about having hired uh, like a hundred new people, one of our friends was out doing the river raft and, uh, the, you know, they were saying going down the rapids, it was like the, the tour guides were just like falling off the, the, uh, the, the boats and then like <laughs> his, his wife actually fell and it was like under, like being drugged underneath the boat and uh, the, the running joke was like uh, it was the tour guide's first time going down the river, at, at, you know, as well. So maybe that tour guide was one of the, the 100 people he got to hire. Um, <clears throat> you know, with all that said, I think it was great. We did some ATVing, and I think the best part about doing Costa Rica is that there's a, a little bit of element of either danger or surprise. Like there was no way in hell you could have done the a, a guided ATV tour. In Costa Rica, that same trail in America because there would just be too much liability. It was sketch at best, but we had a great time covered in mud, and uh, I wouldn't change anything about it. What about you, Chris? What what kind of excursions did you get to do? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, you completely. And we did a we did one of the tours that required us to get on a boat, and we had to. It was a 
it was it wasn't a speedboat, but we were, we were going going at a at a good good clip, and none of us wearing life jackets. We were just out out there on the boat, and then just all of a sudden in the middle of the water, like the captain just kills the engine, and we're like, what? Wait, what just happened? Did the engine die? Are are we there? And we're just free diving here? What? Like what's going on? And then they start handing out life jackets to everybody. Like, hey, put this on, put this on, put this on. And then they had to like go below deck and grab a couple more because there weren't enough on deck. And we're like, okay, yeah, we're happy to put it on, but but tell us what's up. He's like, oh, there's a boat patrol over there, and if they spot you without the life jacket, it's a big fine for us. <laughs> it's it was something like uh, a speed trap here in the U.S. or a seatbelt check or something that says, yeah, you're you're fine until you see the law enforcement official, and then you either slam on the brakes before he catches you for speeding, or you clip your seatbelt on as soon as you see the the police officer. But but yeah, like you said, there were. Uh, maybe some some questionable decisions there that wouldn't fly so well here in the United States, but it's like yeah, you know, do what you, you do what you got to do. It seemed like they had a system down. They spotted the guy plenty early. They killed the engine. We all put our life vests on. We sped past the boat patrol guys and took them off right after that. <laughs> so I'm 100 percent on board with you, right? The ATV stuff, no biggie, right? Like even though I I heard someone rolled it uh, on one of the tours, uh, the speedboat putting on our life, uh, you know, life uh, jackets totally game for zip lining whether it was sketchy or not uh, i'm on board for the one thing i wasn't on board for was the last night i was talking with a dude from uh from london and he said that they went out scuba diving and so mm-hmm. uh they went down uh 30 minutes and they came back up and the boat was gone and it's this group oh, of these yeah. dudes, and they're like what the heck is going on and so they, that's like they the beginning up, of a one of those horror movies. I think there's right? open water. Is that what that movie was called? Yeah, Something like water. that. Yeah, that's 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 terrifying if if that happens to you. And I was like, dude, were you like terrified? He's like, you know, he's like, no, not really. I was like, you know, one thing we were able to float. He's all in two. Like you can still see the coastline. There was, you know, there was boats out there that they can see. He says about thirty minutes had gone by, and then a fishing boat had picked them up. And uh, so they, they ended up going back. And turns out, uh, what had happened is. They went to go do scuba diving. One of the people on the boat was like, she didn't understand that scuba versus snorkeling were two different things. So when it came down time came time to do the uh, the scuba diving, she's like, wait a second, I don't want any part of this. Can you take me snorkeling? So they left, took her snorkeling. She got sick uh, from the motion of the ocean, right? And they just kind of lost track of time. Is the, is what the ultimate problem there was. So uh, you know, anyways, everybody was safe. Um, I think. If I was in the water with my wife, I would have been panicking, right? Like, I just feel like I got to I gotta figure out a way to save her, and I have no idea how to do it in this situation. If it was me, I probably would have been like, whatever, I'll try to swim ashore or do something. But, yeah, thank God everybody was okay. I don't know if we're selling anybody on Costa Rica with all this <laughs> stuff, but I can tell you guys, uh, we are going to go back as a family, and we're going to go chop it up and have a good time. Like, it, it is, God, honestly, the beautis, be- most beautiful country I've been to, both people-wise and countryside. Yeah, yeah, and, and I don't want the yeah, I don't want people to take away that it's not it's not safe to be there. It is very safe there. Like I think the the U.S. has them on a code stage four hazard for for COVID. But when we were there, everyone wore masks. And, you know, the result we were on, everyone was vaccinated. Everyone seemed to be safe. Like to get to, into the airport, you had to wash your hands, which is more than what we do here in the U.S. I've never had to wash my hands to get into an airport. But they they take it seriously. They are a tourism centric country. They want people to come. They want people to feel safe and. I definitely felt really safe there, um, Dude, that perspective. Can we talk a little bit about the airport? Like, they have it dialed in, right? Like, we get off the plane and we go out to the luggage, and like, homeboy, like, it has the carousel, but he's just pulling them all out and just lining them up all nicely for us, right? And so that was one experience. Getting through customs was like nothing, right? Just like scan this QR code, high five the dude, run away, have a good time. Coming back, it was like we got dropped off plenty of time early, got a bite to eat. Um, you go through immigration. They're just like, did you have fun? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, get the heck out of my way. And then you go through security. And it was like, I just, I didn't even wait. And there's no TSA pre-check or clear or global entry. It's just like, just walk through here. They treat you like a human being. You're not a terrorist and go about your day. Uh, and then, you know, I landed in Denver and then it was right back to the whole like uh, uh, violation festival, right? Like we were going to like, scan you and probe you and touch you and open up stuff that shouldn't be looked inside. But, you know, I think the I think the Costa Ricans have that thing dialed in. So 10 out of 10 when it comes to dealing with the airport. Yeah. Yeah. 10 out of 10 on on hospitality as well. I would agree. Uh, the other excursion we did was uh, zip lining. So we, you had asked how, how that experience was. And 
the place we went to, uh, very safe, very safe, very dialed in, very buttoned in. Um, they followed protocol to a T. I could see them doing the, you know, the exact same safety checks for every single member of our group. They all had radios. They were constantly communicating back and forth. This is, yeah, this line is clear. Go ahead and send this person. Uh, beautiful, beautiful countryside. Like that's probably one of those once in a lifetime uh, experiences. Um, I highly recommend a zip lining trip in Costa Rica if you ever get the chance. Yeah. One of the, uh, the things that kind of surprised me, like I, you know, like I said before, like I've met 10 of these people in the past, but like the other, uh, you know, two or two or 300 people is my first time seeing them outside of zoom. I was kind of shocked. Like I'm, I'm a big dude. Like I'm like six foot two. And anytime I saw somebody that was taller than me, I was instantly just pissed. I'm like, no, I've seen you in zoom. You're not allowed to be taller than me. Uh, and there was just, there was some people that like, just blew me away. Like I'd seen them in person. I'm like, man, you were like, kind of stocky dude like he obviously hit the gym like i was i was impressed by a lot of things and then i'm trying to think there was a handful of people that everything about them on zoom lined up exactly with uh the way that i had seen them in person but the one that kind of stood out uh was uh dally i don't know if you were able to kind of stand mm -hmm. up next to him he's actually a pretty tall yeah. dude i think he's about six foot yeah yeah, yeah you go. no one knows is... what the hell we're talking about now so good job brian <laughs> All right, well, we continue to get great comments about our dad joke of the week. Dad joke of the week. This week, Brian is up. Uh, I went to the grocery store this morning, and I accidentally cut off an albino person. He was so pissed off. I was like, dude, you need to lighten up. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. <laughs> That's a good one. All right, to wrap things up. Our credit bureau and rating system desperately needs a change. DDoS attacks are evolving to hit VoIP providers now that's relatively easy to mitigate web-based attacks. Deep fake voices are a real threat to businesses. Lastly, Costa Rica is awesome. They're open for business and please go visit. That's all we have for this week. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. You can find us all on LinkedIn. Links will be in the description. Follow us on Instagram at Pedcat Podcast to see our photos from Costa Rica. You can help us grow the podcast by telling somebody else about it. Thank you to all our listeners and subscribers who rated us five stars in the iTunes store and left us a review. We appreciate you all spreading the word to help grow the show. The best way to find us is to search for the Pedcat Podcast on your favorite podcast listening app. For my co-host Brian Deach, I'm Chris Lee. Thanks for listening. We'll see you all next week. And as always, have a nice day. Right on. Grace, thank you for listening. Not Chris's wife, but Grace. <laughs> yeah, and Glenn, our thoughts and prayers are with you, buddy. Your entire family. Yeah, yeah. Hope things, hope things improve and catch you on the next episode. Have a nice day.